Welcome to this week's Book of Mormon video. We are in Alma chapter 8, and we'll go through chapter 12 today. We're going to give a little historical background and a little context and a little bit of content from the Book of Mormon for this week. And so if you'll go with me to Alma 8, let's begin. If you recall, Alma is the, uh, he was the chief judge, but he set that aside, gave that over to somebody else, that he might focus more fully on being the religious leader, the high priest over the land, uh, running the church on earth, God's spokesman. Well, if we go to verse 1, we notice that he was in the land of Gideon. He did some great work there. But he leaves, and it's interesting, at the end of verse 1, what does he do? He goes home, back to Zarahemla, the capital city. And he rests, which I think there's a, a power in when we're finished with our work, uh, to rest, uh, to recoup, to build strength and energy. I think there's a discussion worth having there is, do we work really hard six days of the week, and do we really rest on the seventh? Some great things. Let's go to verse 3 now, because he's going to go to a, a, the land of Melik. And then he's going to go north. Verse 6 says it's a three-day journey north of the land of Melik. He comes to the city called Ammonihah. Now, this is an important city. Because the geography here plays a role here. Because they're three days north of all of these Nephite lands that we've been talking about, you have to recall that the, the Lamanites and that nation is south. Then you have these Nephite nations in capital city. And way up north, three days journey, we have Ammonihah. That gives this city, we'll find out, a artificial sense of security. Because when Alma tells them, repent or this city is going to be destroyed in one day, they look at him and think, you're nuts. There is no way that the Nephites could be destroyed, let alone all the way up here to our powerful and great city. The Lamanites would take days, maybe weeks, months, maybe even years to get up to where we're at, is what they might be thinking in the back of their, their mind. So let's see what, what uh, Alma's going to do here. Uh, verse 7 is interesting. It says the name of Ammonihah of the city is named after the man who settled it. This happens a lot. Uh, if you'll notice the footnote of your scriptures, it puts the footnote of Moriancomer, which is really interesting because nowhere in the Book of Mormon is there a name of an individual called Moriancomer. It was Joseph Smith who at one time, I, I believe the story goes, he, somebody says, Joseph, will you please bless my baby? And after he blessed the baby, he uh, gave the baby the name Mahanre Moriankamer. There's a name you want somebody to give your, your son. And they said, wow, where did you get that name? I'm sure they said it just like that too. And Joseph said, it just revealed to me, that was the name of the brother of Jared. So Jared gets the name Jared, his brother gets the name Mahanre Moriankomer. Well, in the footnote there, uh, the land is called Moriankomer. That's where we get that name from. Kind of fun. Uh, another place is in 2 Nephi chapter 5, when the Nephites, those who follow Nephi, leave Laman and Lemuel. Uh, they get together, they call the land Nephi after Nephi. They even call the next king Nephi after Nephi. So this is a, a trend. It's a popular thing. It's interesting. In America... Many of our lands have one of two names. One is it's either a, a name from the American Indians. What was it called before? What do the Indians call the land? And another one is they give it their English name or their European name. I mean, how many cities are New York versus the old York in, in the old land? Uh, New England and so forth. There's many of them. But in this case, it's named after the first person. Maybe we do that a little bit. Or we name it after somebody. Taylorsville might be named after John Taylor or another Taylor, right? Uh, St. George may be named after King George. Or uh, St. George, Utah is named after uh, one of the great apostles in the early days of the church, George. So we do name lands after people today. Let's go on here and see what's going on. Is Alma gets rejected completely from the city. It's where he leaves. I mean, they're not nice to him. In fact, if you look at verse 13, 
Uh, 10 tells us he labored much in the spirit, wrestling with God. I mean, this was not an, uh, I'm done. This looks like the city's waste. He diligent in here. But what's the reaction of this people? Verse 13. Now, when the people had said this and withstood all his words and reviled him and spit upon him and caused that he should be cast out of their city, he departed. I don't know. Maybe it's my culture that I grew up in, but how low has your society dropped to where spitting upon somebody you disagree with is acceptable? Maybe we're seeing that uh, today, certain parts, certain cultures. To me, that is a pretty uh, base level of treating another individual that you disagree with. Especially in this case, it's a prophet. The Holy Ghost has to be piercing their hearts. They're just rejecting the whole message here. So he leaves. But what happens? Well, we know that the angel comes to him and says, go back. Now, it's interesting that the angel that visits Alma is the same angel that visited Alma earlier when his dad's prayer was being answered to awaken my son. And Alma was shook and dropped to the earth and unconscious and so forth. But he's not the only angel in this story here. Amulek also has an angel comes and tells him, hey, there's a prophet of God. You're going to find him, welcome him, help him. Uh, we don't know if it's the same angel or a different one. It never says in the story here, but it's a, it's a great story of angels preparing people for great work. Let's go to chapter 9 now. In chapter 9, we're going to go to verse 4. Alma and Amulek go out together now, and, and there's some great stories. Hope you read it and have a good time with the reading there. But in here, it says, the people of Ammonias, said, they said also, we will not believe thy words. Now, they're making that a conscious decision. I want you to think about this. Is belief a choice? Or is it something we're just blessed with? Oh, we just believe I was born this way. Uh, here, they're making it, this is the people of Ammoniah. We will not believe. In other words, we're making a choice not to believe what you say. We're not even going to try. I think maybe there's a lesson in there, a principle that believing is a choice. You have to choose to want to believe before you'll ever be able to believe something. Uh, I think there's a great thing. And in there, again, there says, we're, we're not going to believe that this city's going to be destroyed in one day. Uh, great words in there. Let's go down to verse 18. Again, this is Alma 9, verse 18. Behold, I say unto you, that if ye persist in your wickedness, that your day shall not be prolonged in the land, for the Lamanites shall be sent upon you, and if ye repent not, they shall come in a time when you know not, and ye shall be visited with utter destruction, and it shall be according to the fierce anger of the Lord. So, notice, God is not going to destroy this city without multiple warnings, including Alma being sent back to tell them, I not only am telling you to repent, I am now giving you forewarning that if you don't repent, you're going to be destroyed. Now, let's go to chapter 10 for a moment. This is a story where the people say, why would we believe you? They're interested in who people are, whether they believe them or not. In other words, you'll notice when they first started out, it's like, hey, you know, Alma, you're not the chief judge anymore. You're not somebody who we consider important anymore. So we don't have to listen to you. It's all about who are you to before I have to listen to you. So when Alma shows up and now Amulek's with him, and I think God chose Amulek for a reason, so they'll have a second witness here, and it's somebody who they should listen to according to their definition of who they should listen to. Notice in verse 2, Amulek stands up and he preaches, and the first thing he does is he gives the reason why they should listen to him. In other words, he's stating not his authority, but their definition of why I'm important. He gives his genealogy. I'm the son of Gedona, who was the son of Ishmael. I'm a descendant of Amenadi. And then here we know uh, this one little side note that we know nothing about. 
It was the same Amenadite who interpreted the writings which was upon the wall of the temple, which was written by the finger of God. We have nothing else in the scriptures that tells us this story. So in here, somehow there was this story where the Lord wrote on the temple with his finger. And I know my virtual background, my finger disappears. But when it does, the Lord writes on the wall. And there must have been this miraculous story that they all know about. And he's giving, you should listen to me because that guy that you all know about, I'm his whatever ancestor, his descendant. And he even goes in verse 3. I come from Nephi, who came from Lehi. I'm a descendant of Manasseh, the son of... So we know here that Lehi and his descendants, they're not Ephraimites, they're Manassehites. So that... I think play some interesting stories we won't talk much about today. Verse 4, Behold, I am also a reputation of no... Excuse me, let's start that again. again. Behold, I am also a man of no small reputation among all those who know me. Yea, and behold, I have many kindreds and friends, and I have acquired much riches by the hand of my industry. He sets that up because they might listen to that. Rather than, you know what, I'm nobody, but I'm called of God. I mean, Joseph Smith, really, 14-year-old obscure boy in New York. Nobody should listen to him, except the fact that it was God who called him. In this case, they're like, you're not going to listen to a prophet who used to be the chief high priest. But let me tell you why you should listen to me. And that's what Amulek's doing here. And he gives some great messages here. Let's go to verse 14 for a little more background to this story. And again, as you read all the verses and add the depth to it and use your Come Follow Me resources or other resources to add principles and doctrine and power, uh, let's just add a little bit of background. Verse 14 says, Now it was those men who sought to destroy them who were lawyers, who were hired or appointed by the people to administer the law. So... This isn't the common people out in the street attacking Alma and Amulek. This is a very specific group of people who, because of their profession, have been chosen or are choosing themselves or maybe a combination of both to go and attack Alma and Amulek. Uh, they're, they're lawyers and that's what their, their job is. Notice verse, verse 15. They were learned in all the arts and cunning of the people. You know, there are some people that get sent to court and they just don't have an articulate way to uh, express their viewpoint. And lawyers just use their fancy words and legal understanding to manipulate and control things. And that's what's happening here. Except there's one thing different about Alma and Amulek. The power of God is with them, and they're both educated in the law. One was the chief judge. The other is a man of no small reputation. So all of the crossing of words, trying to do their little tricks, uh, fail. Let's go to chapter 11 for a moment. Uh, this is an interesting beginning to a chapter. I really believe everything that Mormon put in these plates, uh, the, this record, brings us to the Savior. But the first... Many verses, first 20 verses, deals with Nephite coinage. And there's a lot of interesting discourses about what's the most effective way to have money. In other words, it's not a 1, a 5, and a 10, and a $20 bill. Uh, if you have a 1, and a 2, and a $4 bill, it, there's ways to make it more, energy, uh, more savings. In other words, with three bills, you can have just about any amount of currency, and the Nephite coinage has that. There's some great things about that. But more importantly, I want you to think about I think there's a power in what they're trying to do. They believe money will buy any sense of power, influence, uh, and people are corrupted by it. Offer enough money, they'll give in. Uh, I, but it's interesting here how strong Amulek is when he says, no, I'm not in it for the money. So there's some interesting things here. Let's go straight to... Oh, how about go to verse 37. We have Zeezrom and his argument and then Amulek 
debating. And it's really a spiritual debate, which I think can be healthy. I know there's some people out there like, I don't really want to argue religion. I don't think you argue, but I think we should have a freedom to everyone express your uh, point of view because the Spirit will testify truth. And people, whether they accept it or reject it, they'll feel one way or the other. And, and I think we should allow everyone to have their opinion. Even people that have ridiculous uh, point of views, let's let them talk. I've known some people that have shared some heavy anti-Mormon literature, and and people are like, well, we need to stop that. I go, no, let them talk. The more they rant, the more we they're exposed to who they really are and what they really want to say. Whereas, I think, give us time with our message of we are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We love the Lord. We worship Him. We honor him, and we have prophets that guide and lead this work today. I think if we can share our message the way it truly is intended, I, people will hear that message. And likewise, if there are people out there saying horrible, evil things about the church, let them share their message. But make sure we stand up and share uh, the truth, and then people will have a, a an understanding of who's what. Let's go to verse 37, I said. And I say unto you, again, that he cannot save them in their sins. So here's this debate between Zeezrom and Amulek. Can God save people? Anybody? And Amulek's going to say, God cannot save us in our sins. I think there is a major discussion that should be explained on the difference between in and from our sins. What does it mean to save somebody in their sins versus what does it mean to save somebody from our sins? What I mean by that is if I am a sinner and I'm going to continue to live in my sins and I have no expectation or uh, plan on changing my sins, God is not going to come down and save me in my sins. But I am a sinner. I have made major mistakes in my life. And I continue to make mistakes, but I'm trying to make them better. And most importantly, I'm turning my heart over to the Savior. I'm trying to be born again. In that case, the Savior says, I'm going to save you from your sins. There's some great things in there. Uh, continuing on in the verse. He hath said that no unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven. Therefore, how can ye be saved except ye inherit the kingdom of heaven? Therefore, ye cannot be saved in your sins. So think of that line as he goes through this discussion and this debate here. While we move on to the rest of this chapter. Chapter 11 may be the best chapter in all of scriptures about the resurrection. What is it? The definition is in here. Probably as clear as any definition uh, I've ever heard of it. In fact, that's verse 43, which we'll get down there. So jump down to the 40s. We'll go to 43 first. The spirit and the body shall be reunited again in its perfect form. That is a great definition of a resurrection. Again, I sometimes with death, often with death, death comes sadness and heartache and disappointment and and uh, a lot of negative emotions. But if we listen to the prophets, we know that death is not the end. There will be a reuniting of the body and the spirit. In fact, 43 says, Limb and joint shall be restored to its proper frame, even as we now are in this time, and we shall be brought to stand before God. Now, I want to make clear, it talks about in here that no unclean thing can enter the kingdom of God. In other words, uh, that's in uh, the Doctrine and Covenant section 1, too, and it's several places that you, if you're unclean, you can't be in the presence of God. Well, we're all sinners, so who can be in the presence of God? Even those who don't repent and accept Jesus Christ will be brought forth before the Savior someday to be judged. How can they do that if they're unclean? This is a gift of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Everybody, regardless of sinner or righteous man, will be brought before God to be judged. The power is those who choose to repent and choose to accept the Savior, the atonement will allow that person to become cleansed to remain in the presence of God. 
where those who are wicked and vile and evil will be judged, condemned, and cast out from the presence of God again for a final time. Wonderful things in here. Read chapter 11 about the resurrection. Again, this brings comfort to those who have lost loved ones. Uh, 41 talks about wicked remain such. Uh, the death is temporal, but Christ shall loose the bands. That's verse 42. Love that. Uh, 44. Now this restoration shall come to all, both old and young, both bond and free, both male and female, both the wicked and the righteous. And even there shall not so much as a hair of their heads shall be lost, but everything shall be restored to its perfect frame. Uh, let's talk about this one just for a moment here. If you have small kids, sometimes they like they don't understand this. Here's a, a thing that you might be able to do to help them out. Go find an old car or an old couch, uh, even an old home, something that you would, could restore. Say, okay, we have this old car. We want to restore it. What does that mean? And then show them a, a, a car, an old car that's been restored. Say, now what does it take to take an old car to restore it? There's a lot of work involved. Some cleaning up, some repairing, some replacing some broken parts, paint, maybe new seats. And talk about making that change. But it's still like a 1946 uh, Cadillac is still going to be a 1946 Cadillac. It's not going to be a, a 2020 Corvette or a Lamborghini or something. It's going to be the same thing. So I think we have the discussion where... We're going to be resurrected, but we're going to be resurrected back to the same thing that we were. I mean, I am a person with uh, two eyes, uh, two ears, a mouth, a, a body. And if I've been allowing Jesus Christ to transform me, I'm going to resurrect into a transformed person to be more like the Savior himself. If I'm an evil, horrible person, I'll be resurrected. But I'm going to be resurrected back to an evil, horrible person who refuses to accept the Savior. So you can have a great inter interesting discussion about a restoration and uh, you know, go on a little family home evening activity and see a, a restored car and one that needs to be restored and have a little fun with that. Let's go to chapter 12 now. This is our last chapter of this scripture block. As they continued and finish up this great uh, teaching to these people here in this wicked city, uh, I want to go to verse six, and behold, I say unto, behold, I say unto you, all, that this was a snare of the adversary, which he has laid to catch this people, that he might bring you into subjection unto him. You know what? It, it, I, I have one. I should have it here with me. A snare, like a bear trap, one of those big ones that have the claws on it. You say, okay, set it, and then say, okay, who's going to put your hand in that? Just see what they say. Uh, or go get a mouse trap. Say, who'd be willing to put your finger in there and see if you can get the trap to set? And if somebody tries it with a mouse trap, it might not hurt them as bad, but then get a rat trap. You know those big ones that have the big old bar coming across it? Say, try this one. Uh, and then make a list of some of the snares. What are some of the snares? Little things that the adversary does that we get trapped in all the time. Some of the deceits and the lies and the false things that the adversary uses today. There's, and there's a lot of them. But notice what happens next in the verse. This is still verse 6 of chapter 12. That he might encircle you about with his chains. That he might chain you down to everlasting destruction. Notice, he snares you first, so now you're trapped. You still can wiggle around, but you possibly might get out of a trap. But while you're ensnared or trapped, he takes chains and he wraps them around you and over and over and over until you can't get out. And then what does he do? He drags you down. Complete control. Likewise, I can go up in the forest and I can set a little trap and I might catch an animal. I got their leg or something. But if I can get a chain and I wrap them up and up, hey, they're not going anywhere. They're under my power. That's what the adversary does. That's the power of the adversary. And you can use lots of examples from maybe tobacco, alcohol, pornography, uh, anything addictive is easy to illustrate with. We're enticed with something small. We get the little bit of a trap. And then while we have that little bit of trap, the chains start coming around us 
It's a powerful lesson, and I hope that is helpful for you. In verse 10, there's another one in here that I want to look at. He, verse 10, and therefore, he that will harden his heart, the same receiveth the lesser, the lesser portion of the word. And he that will not harden his heart, to him is given the greater portion. I think you have, you can discuss how can you get more if you already have some. If you harden your heart, can you get less? Well, the answer is, yeah, this is easy for teenagers. Walk into a math class when you really don't want to learn. Your heart is not open to want to learn. See how much math they're going to learn that day. Or, you know, the kid who's in a, a Zoom meeting or something, and he's looking around the room and not really, his heart is not into that lesson. You're just going to get a small portion. In fact, they usually ask the questions, you know, uh, do I have to know this? Is this on a test? Uh, what, is this really that big of a deal? Versus the person who has a soft heart, they'll receive more. They'll just learn. That's how. That's the principle of learning. And we could talk about learning for a long time, but we'll keep moving on here. Uh, verse 14, notice what condemns us. 14 says our works will, but it also says our thoughts will. So the scripture in Psalms that says you have to have clean hands and a pure heart. It's clean hands, a pure heart, a clean mind. Again, how do you get that? That's the atonement of Christ. I really don't think there's a way to cleanse the whole soul except we turn our hearts over to the Savior and have him do that for us. We can have some fun things with that. Let's go to verse 32. And maybe we'll end here. 32. Alma 12, verse 32. And God... Therefore, God gave unto them commandments after having made known unto them the plan of redemption. That is an interesting phrase. Why does why is the plan given before the commandment given? It's all about understanding. We gain knowledge, then we have to understand, then the command is given. So if we have true knowledge and understanding of the plan of salvation, and then the commandment is, thou shalt not kill, we start to understand taking the life of somebody's, uh, that, that's not our responsibility. Uh, thou shalt not lie. If we understand the plan of salvation, we understand why that's such a serious crime. Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. In other words, a sexual relationship between a man and a woman, why is that really that big of a deal? And the world says it's entertainment. Uh, God says, that, let me teach you the plan of salvation. And once you learn about the, the covenants God made with Abraham that we have today, we start to understand, boy, I'm, I'm messing with eternal families. And the plan makes the commandments make sense. So I am not perfect with this, but there's a power when, as a parent, you try you teach the understanding and the reason why. Then you give the commandment, the counsel, and the guidance. They're more willing and more likely to follow because they understand why. For example, I went in the backyard uh, a while back and I said, okay, I want you to clear all the weeds in this section. Oh, my kids, you thought I asked them to uh, dig their own grave. It was terrible. I changed it up a little bit. I said, you know, kids, I have bought this... Uh, horseshoe set we want to play horseshoes uh what do we need to do here like well let's clear out this section here and uh and put some sand here they were pulling out the weeds and cleaning it out so fast it was a lot of fun again when you see and understand the plan the big picture the commandments make sense and they really do i'll leave you my testimony that we have a beautiful plan of salvation and the more we study that and the more we understand that uh, the more these commandments make sense, they're not a bunch of arbitrary set of rules. God just wants to see if we're going to be obedient or not. Uh, they're actually things that will bless us and help us. And I pray that we can find that. Next week, we're going to study Alma 13, 14, 15, and 16. Four chapters, and I'll see you next week.